this is the third part of our discussion on continuity of complex valued functions so far we have seen the importance of continuity and we also precisely defined when a given complex valued function is continuous we also saw some further properties so for example we saw the effect of addition of functions on continuity so for example if two given complex valued functions are continuous then their addition is also continuous their division is also continuous under certain conditions and their multiplication etc etc now we are going to continue our discussion on the same lines and we are going to discuss a further operation on functions so in particular we are going to see continuity and composition of functions and more importantly we are going to see the consequences of continuity on different properties of complex valued functions so this is going to be most interesting part of our today's discussion so let's uh, revise the definition of continuity so remember we defined continuity of a given complex valued function in two ways so this is the first definition where we are calculating the limit of a given complex valued function at point z not so in other words when z approaches to z not and if this limit is equal to the functional value at z not and of course the second condition says that it must exist so if they are equal then the function is continuous and uh, the second definition is a more precise epsilon delta definition of continuity of a function so in this definition we say that a function f of z is continuous at a point z not if for every epsilon greater than 0 there existed delta greater than 0 such that the distance between the functional values and f of z not is as small as we want in other words it is less than epsilon whenever the distance between z and z not is less than delta so in other words the functional values are approaching to f of z not as we are getting closer and closer to z not now we are going to see what is composition of functions and what is the effect of continuity on the composition of functions so uh, given a function f of z and another complex valued function g of z the composition of function written as g circle f of z applied on this thing so this uh, g circle f is a function which is composition of function and we are applying this function on the variable z so how it is defined so it is defined in the following way so g of f of z so from here we can see that so there are two steps in the first step we are calculating the functional value f of z and in the second step we are calculating g of f of z in other words once we calculated f of z then we apply g on that functional value okay so it's uh, it is something like so you you give an input of z to this function f which is just like a machine and uh, then we get an output f of z and then again this output is input to our second function which is g so we apply a g on this output of the first function which is f of z and at the end the output is going to be g of f of z and of course you can see that there is an order so in the first step we applied function f so here you can see that in the first step we applied the function f and in the second step we apply g and we apply g on the output of the first step which is f of z so that the output is basically g of f of z now uh, let's try to consider a very simple example how we actually calculate this functional value of this composition so consider for example f of z is equal to let's say z square so we know how to calculate the output for this function so for example f of 1 is going to be 1 square which is 1 f of 2 is going to be 2 square which is 4 etc etc and similarly we can calculate uh, for example f of 1 plus iota by complete calculating its square now let's consider another function g of z and let's say this g of z is 
1 over z and we want to calculate what is g composition f of z okay so we want to know what is this thing so uh, let's consider in particular z is equal to 2 okay so uh, the starting point of course we want to calculate the image of this function uh, image of 2 uh, under this function so we start from 2 so in the first step as we know that we are going to apply the function f on this okay so this is the first step we apply f on this number 2 so when we apply 2 the output is going to be f of 2 which is in fact equal to 4 okay now this output of the first step is going to be the input of our second step so in other words we apply g on this output which is 4 so g of 4 now we can see that 4 is non zero so we can apply this function g on this and of course if z is zero then we cannot apply this g on that number because the division by zero is not allowed so 4 is non zero so we can apply g on this uh, number 4 so it's going to be 1 over 4 so we can say that uh, in fact g composition f of 2 is going to be equal to 1 by 4 so that's how we calculate composition of two functions so uh, in particular so um, if we have a point le let's say denoted by this red dot in the domain of f so remember in the first step we are applying uh, the first function f so that's why uh, the point on which we are applying uh, this composition must belong to the domain of f so since in the first step we apply this function f so this z must belong to the domain of f so this a is basically domain of f so we apply function uh, f on this uh, red point and we get this red square point in uh, the range of f now we want to apply the function g and of course if we want to apply the function g then this point must be in the domain of g okay so and when we apply g on this uh, uh, red square then we get this red star and similarly if we take another point then uh, let's say this yellow circle then we follow like this first we apply f and then we apply g okay and similarly uh, the other points so in other words uh, composition calculation of composition is just like a two-step procedure so in the first step we apply the function f and in the second step we apply the function g so uh, but it is a function you know if i if i just ignore this middle part b okay so uh, let's just uh, consider for a moment that this b is not here so what are we getting after applying this composition so we start from a point of a and we are getting an output which is a point of c so it's just like a function you you are taking inputs from a and you are getting outputs in c okay so it is a function so composition of function is a function now uh, the next uh, discussion is so if we are given composition of two function and if uh, both are continuous then the composition is also a continuous so which is an important property of the composition of functions now of course uh, we know that if uh, we want to consider the composition then it is something like this so we start from f so if f is continuous so in other words f is continuous at a point z naught and uh, g is continuous at point f of z naught because uh, uh, when we are considering this composition then in the first step we apply f so we get f of z naught and in the next step we apply g on f of z naught so that's why we are requiring that f is continuous at point z naught and g is continuous at f of z naught because we apply g on f of z naught okay so so if these two conditions are satisfied then we say that the composition which is of course so we start from z naught and we go to okay, so g of f of z naught okay so the composition so this is basically g composition f so the claim is if f is continuous at z naught g is continuous at f of z naught then 
g composition f which is a function from this set a to this set c is continuous at point z so that's what we want to prove now uh, how to prove this thing so as we know uh, the statement consists of two parts so the first part is assumption what is the given thing and the second part is what we need to prove so the given part is f is continuous at a point z naught and uh, the given part consists of two parts so this is the first part and the second part says that g is continuous at f of z naught and uh, using these facts we have to show that g composition f is continuous at z naught so let's first use the second part where uh, the given thing is g is continuous at f of z naught so since g is continuous at f of z naught so by using epsilon delta definition of continuity so for epsilon greater than 0 there must exist a number let's call it gamma greater than 0 such that uh, the distance between g of z and g of f of z naught is less than epsilon whenever The distance between z and f of z naught is less than this number gamma. Now, uh, as we know that in the definition of uh, epsilon delta definition of continuity, so over here we have the point where we are checking the continuity. So in this case, g is continuous at f of z naught. So that's why we replace the point z naught with f of z naught here, and once again over here we replace the point z naught with f of z naught because g is continuous at f of z naught now the second uh, part which is given which is given fact uh, is f is continuous at a point z naught okay so since f is continuous at point z naught so epsilon greater than 0 and in this case, I'm not going to take uh, the same epsilon twice because we have uh, this epsilon is independent, so we can't use it uh, twice here. So let's call it some other number, but uh, uh, I'm going to name it, let's say, epsilon prime greater than zero. Uh, there exists for epsilon prime greater than zero, there exists, let's say, delta greater than zero. such that the distance between f of z and f of z naught is less than epsilon prime whenever the distance between z and z naught is less than delta now let's see how to combine these two statements to prove what we want to prove uh, that uh, how g composition f is continuous at z naught so if we want to show that g composition f is continuous at z naught then we need to show that uh, g composition f of z minus okay so let me let me write down to show here so what do we need to show so to show is for epsilon greater than 0 there exists delta greater than 0 such that g of f of z minus g of f of z naught is less than epsilon whenever z minus z naught is less than delta okay, so that's what we want to show now how to prove this statement using these two statements okay so let's call it the first statement number one and number two statement so how to use these two statements to prove this fact now uh, focus on the following thing so uh, the first statement holds whenever the distance between z and f of z naught is less than gamma okay so and over here this epsilon prime is independent and this says that whenever uh, the distance between z and z naught is less than delta then the distance between f of z and f of z naught is less than epsilon prime so if we use 
So instead of this z, if we say that this is f of z, then if the distance between f of z and f of z naught is less than gamma, then of course the distance between uh, g of f of z. So now here we can replace. So this statement is true for any complex number. So instead of taking uh, z here, we are just taking f of z here. So of course, if it is true if for any complex number satisfying this condition, then uh, if f of z satisfies this condition, then it must also be true. So we, we are just going to replace is f of z over here. Okay. Now, but it will it will not prove it will not prove the thing because we want a condition on z that whenever the distance between z and z naught is less than this delta, then the distance between g of f of z and g of f of z naught is less than epsilon. Okay. So replacing f of z here uh, is allowed, but it will not solve the issue. So we want uh, that whenever z minus z naught is less than delta, then this is less than epsilon. So for that, we use the second part. So instead of taking epsilon prime here, if we take gamma over here, okay, so let me remove this epsilon prime over here and let me write down gamma over here. So if this uh, gamma is greater than zero, okay, so since uh, this uh, gamma is our choice, so we can take it to be this gamma, which is basically a condition uh, we found from the first statement. Okay, so whenever uh, z minus z naught is less than delta, then the distance between f of z and f of z naught is less than gamma. And when the distance between them is less than gamma, then the first statement says that the distance between g of f of z and g of f of z naught must be less than epsilon. So basically, we go in the following way. The distance between z and z naught less than delta implies the distance between f of z and f of z naught less than gamma. And whenever the distance between f of z and f of z naught less than gamma, then the distance between g of f of z and g of f of z naught less than epsilon. So just taking, so what is the main trick of the proof? Just taking this uh, uh, epsilon, the independent uh, number for checking the continuity of f to be this gamma instead of any independent. So we just take this gamma, which is basically the output of the first step. Okay, so for this gamma, the distance between g of z and g of f of z naught is less than epsilon. And we take the same gamma for the epsilon delta definition of the continuity of f of z. So uh, if we take this gamma and then combining these two statements, okay, so combining 1 and 2 gives the result. So in other words, what is the main part of the proof or main trick of the proof? Just taking uh, the second in epsilon, okay, so for checking the continuity of f to be this gamma, which is the output of first statement. So now, uh, what is really the situation here? So for this epsilon, uh, we found this gamma and corresponding to this gamma, we found this delta. Okay, so in other words, whenever the distance between z and z naught is less than delta, then the distance between f of z and f of z naught is less than gamma. And whenever the distance between f of z and f of z naught is less than gamma, then the distance between g of f of z and g of z f of z naught is less than epsilon. Okay, so in other words, if you take elements inside this disk, then all of them are mapped inside this disk. Okay, so you can say that all of these elements are mapped inside this thing. So this is the image. And when you apply G on this thing, then all of these elements, which are of course uh, in the domain of G, so when we apply G on them, so this is F, so when we apply G on them, then all of them are mapped inside this thing. So the distance between g of f of z and g of f of z naught lies uh, or is less than epsilon or lies inside this disk. So this is the end of our discussion. We will continue discussing uh, different properties of continuous complex valued function in our next discussions.